RNA. Oops. Sorry, recording is in progress uh, for RNA binding protein uh, binding. Uh, and, uh, you know, so all sorts of aspects of RNA metabolism, such as uh, splicing and transport and uh, uh, stability. Uh, and then finally, I'll just briefly mention that everything that we do, as well as many other um, projects that we have, such as tissue specific functional networks and disease gene associations from functional omics data, all of this is available through uh, human base. Uh, that's our uh, website that you can get to at humanbase.io that's really developed from the Flatiron Institute. Um, so without much further ado, let me uh, really uh, talk a little bit more about this idea of decoding the genomes. And of course, so far, most of disease genetics has really focused on genes. So here, of course, we are just showing uh, them symbolically as a few exons. Uh, but in reality, of course, we all know that the reality is much more complex. Protein coding genes are, of course, a little less than 2% of the genome, and the other 98% encode regulatory signals that are regulating how these uh, genes are turned on and off, as well as um, uh, RNA, mRNA processing uh, in terms of and transport in terms of creation of proteins. And so the issue with these 98%, of course, is that the search space there is incredibly vast, right? So it's likely impossible to really uh, map the space fully in terms of rare and ultra rare variants in most contexts, even if we actually deeply phenotype large whole populations. Uh, so many rare mutations or those that are pre present, for example, in embryonic lethal context or other rare contexts uh, would still really remain a mystery. So we really need an equivalent of the genetic code that can tell us how DNA encodes amino acids in the genetic code. So we want to be able to do this equivalent code in the regulatory space. Um, so why is this hard? Of course, the key challenge is that most disease mutations we might rarely observe and multiple mutations in the non-coding space can lead to similar outcomes. So all these individuals shown here might have the same disease, but could be caused by different combinations of variants. Uh, and many of these we might never or rarely observe, not in enough power to be able to really link them to disease. And so being able to find a way uh, to complement quantitative genetics uh, in being able to really interpret these rare mutations is really critical. Uh, and so for that, we really want to be able to link any non-coding variant to uh, its regulatory impact through, you know, binding basically of, uh, you know, its effect on chromatin or RNA binding, protein binding. And deep learning turns out to be a powerful tool for mapping this regulatory code. So there's been a number of uh, work. So our original paper on this was in 2015. And uh, since then, many, uh, many groups have actually focused on this problem. Uh, and these are just a few of the early papers that used our uh, original approach uh, for a diversity of uh, questions, including poly polygenic disease risk, uh, cancer, blood pressure, and uh, my very favorite of uh, eyebrow thickness phenotype. Um, I'm happy to talk more about really convincing you that this works on a very basic level, but these have been uh, experimentally as well as uh, through external clinical and uh, uh, external holdout data sets have been extensively verified and these approaches are actually quite effective and accurate. What I want to tell you about here is actually this new SAFE framework that enables not just prediction of the biochemical consequences of variants on truly whole genome space, uh, scale, uh, but also this regulatory activity. So the goal of this say framework is really to provide a mapping from any sequence in the human genome or variable to vocabulary of regulatory activities, uh, which we actually call sequence classes. So these we actually systematically discover from chromatin profiling data. Um, so in order to really obtain a comprehensive set of sequence classes, we first developed this, say, deep learning model that predicts 22,000 available, uh, publicly available chromatin profiles from Systrom DB. So this is actually roughly 10 times more uh, various biochemical effects than any prior method, including ours. Um, so this model is basically, you know, it takes in the whole human genome. Uh, it actually is the first also model to have truly whole genome coverage, although with a big asterisk that it's not every single uh, we don't actually center our window in every single base. We actually still go in 100 base pair um, steps, which is uh, significantly more um, 
wider coverage than anyone, including us before, uh, but it's still actually uh, just computationally too intensive to do every single base pair. So the model is never trained on variant data, and that's really important. So the model is just trained on going along the whole sequence, so along the genome. And the way that it's trained is it's basically associating sequences with the matched cheap seek right, peaks. And it's really learning because there are multiple instances of the same uh, let's say transcription factor binding in many places in the genome. That's really the intuition of how it's working because of course it never sees the variants. Um, and also it gets a lot of power from the fact that various features have interactions, right? So various chromatin marks uh, are associated with transcription factor binding and uh, et cetera. And so this is going into this uh, say sequence model. Uh, and after the model is trained, we uh, go through these 30 million sequences for the genome, make predictions for those sequences. Uh, and that gives us this matrix of um, uh, where, can you guys see my uh, mouse right now? Christoph, can you see my mouse? Yes. Okay, perfect. So we get this matrix of, um, you know, 22,000 columns, right? So Fox, where each column is a particular feature, right? So in this case, it's FOXA1, ESR1, whatever is, you know, subscription factors, various chromatin marks, et cetera. Uh, and the rows are these 30 million sequences. So this is, the 30 million just comes out of stepping through the 3 billion long human genome in 100 base pair steps. Uh, and each window is roughly about 4,000 bases, right? So this is actually a pretty wide sequence context that the model takes in. And what it's doing is predicting, saying, okay, in this particular sequence centered around this, uh, you know, here, basically, uh, right? I'm predicting that there will be binding by FOXA1, ESR1, AR1, but not NANOG, CTCF, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and this is done over about 22,000 chromatin profiles spanning 1,300 different cell types, about 1,000 different transcription factors, and 77 histone marks with actually very high accuracy. So average accuracy, you see, is about 0.972. Um, what's really important here, so this gives you basically in silico cheap seek, right? So this is giving you for every place in the genome uh, with 100 base pair step, I'm giving you uh, the prediction for cheap seek over those 22,000 uh, different chromatin measurements. But what's really important then is then you can actually uh, identify clusters in these measurements. And those are your sequence classes, right? So here you can see that there's a very consistent response across, you know, in this cartoon way, of course, uh, but across these three uh, factors. So that's actually the FOXA1, ESR1, AR1 sequence class. And for example, here is a very clear, another consistent cluster, and that's liver enhancer sequence class. In reality, this is actually what this looks like, uh, right? So in reality, the mapping of this regulatory landscape of these 30 million sequences is done with this uh, UMAP. Uh, so this UMAP is actually colored by sequence classes. Each point on this map is one of those 30 million sequences. Uh, and of course, that gives you a vector. So for each of those 30 million sequences, you have a vector of 22,000 different epigenetic effects, right? Like epigenetic uh, uh, predictions, this in silico cheap seek vector, uh, right? And then you can cluster that. And then uh, the clusters are colored by color. And then each sequence, so all of this is do done purely in a data-driven way, right? Like no prior knowledge is used, uh, but of course, leveraging this enormous uh, um, epigenetic um, resource, uh, the SysTromDB, right? That of course came out of many, many groups and many uh, projects generating cheap seek, experimental cheap seek data. Uh, but then of course, each sequence class is interpreted and labeled based on enrichment of the underlying chromatin profiles and other annotations. So while the clustering and all of this analysis is done purely in a data-driven way, the name, we do look at prior knowledge to be able to come up with a name, right? So this is very uh, unbiased to prior knowledge, but of course the name, that's where the prior knowledge does come in. So for example, there in yellow is this FOXA1 AR um, ESR1 sequence class that I just showed you before. Uh, and here is the liver intestine specific enhancer sequence class over here. And you can see that really, uh, you know, clustering discovers sequences with low or no regulatory activity. It identifies tissue specific enhancers, polycomb repressive, transcribed, and for chromatin sequence classes. Uh, and finally, of course, there are um, promoter and CTCF cohesin. Uh, binding islands, which might actually 
really emphasize how distinct these regulatory activities are. So you can see that there's the promoter sequences. So why do all of this? So hopefully this is, you know, you realize the importance of identifying these sequence classes and identifying them um, in this data-driven way. But of course, in principle, you could have done this just with the cheap seek data alone. Now, you know, it turns out deep learning really helps with denoising by itself in any case. Uh, so you probably wouldn't find them as cleanly, but you could have identified something by just doing a similar analysis on the cheap seek profiles. And the reason why deep learning is so critical here is this it's that now, because say can quantify these sequence classes through a model, now you can actually use them to predict the impact of any variant on the regulatory variant activity, right? So that means that if you did this from the cheap seek data, then if I give you a single letter change, a single variant in the sequence, we don't actually know what effect it would have either on the biochemistry or certainly on the function of that regulatory sequence class. Whereas with safe prediction, you can immediately say, well, you know, this change from A to G is going to take this liver enhancer sequence. And now the new sequence actually is the low activity sequence. Uh, so it's destroyed the liver enhancer activity of this class. Uh, and that actually doesn't just give us predictions, it can actually allow us to mechanistically interpret the effects of variance. So uh, to apply it, uh, we actually first focused on regulatory mechanisms for known disease mutations. Uh, so we applied sequence classes to predict regulatory mechanisms of all 853 known regulatory disease mutations from M HGMD. Uh, so these are mutations that have been characterized in the literature, and for most of them, the target gene and disease is known. But the mechanism, how this non-coding regulatory variant is actually affecting, you know, this particular target gene and causing the disease is not known. Um, so here, basically, we go through these 853 uh, regulatory disease mutations and predict their effects with, say, uh, and here, you know, here's what the result is. So each variant here is assigned to a sequence class based on their location in the genome, right? So based on basically where it is in that uh, map, that the Lovain clustering assignment, right? So, oops, sorry. Uh, so where it is in this map, right? Remember each variant point here is actually a sequence. Um, and then, this maybe was not a great idea to back up. Okay. Uh, and then actually uh, the way that they're displayed here is in this radial plot, right? The uh, extent of disruption of the, of the uh, by this variant of the regulatory sequence class is shown by how far this particular variant is from this you know, main axis. They're colored by the sequence class that they're in. So for example, P is the promoter sequence class. And as you can imagine, most of the well-known the variants that have been identified in the literature unsurprisingly are affecting promoters, but you can see we find a number of uh, you know, tissue specific enhancers, transcription, stem cell enhancers, et cetera. Um, and then uh, the direction which whether it's increasing uh, you know, function of that sequence class or decreasing uh, is shown in which direction it's going. I believe, and I might be wrong, but I'm pretty sure the ones that are radially out of the circle, these are the ones that are disrupting the sequence class, and these are the ones that are sort of increasing the regulatory function of the sequence class. And both the distance from the axis, radial axis, and the uh, you know, size of the dot show the same thing. They show the extent of uh, this effect. And so then you can actually see that, for example, for uh, developmental diseases here, uh, like uh, triphalangeal thompocyndactyly syndrome, uh, the embryonic stem cell enhancer sequence class is predicted to be disrupted by mutations in the known distal enhancer of sonic hedgehog. So that's a gene, of course, that plays key role in position of growth, limbs and fingers and toes during development. Um, and then we also have uh, sequence classes in retinoblastoma and melanomas that are affecting uh, you know, the third promoter, for example. Uh, and, you know, so you can actually look at known variants that we know are disease associated and that are affecting a known uh, gene in a disease, but we actually can give it a specific mechanistic explanation for how this particular variant is disrupting a promoter of, you know, so for example, in melanoma, the third promoter, and that that's what's actually causing uh, this particular phenotype. All right, so how can we go actually 
beyond the regulatory effects and actually predict what outcome it has in terms of cell type specific expression. Uh, right, so here we actually are going all the way, not just from sequence through the deep learning uh, to the chip seek data, right, to the biochemical effects or even to regulatory effects, but we're actually taking these basically in silico chip seeks predicted by the regulatory model and training it on cell type specific models to predict specific uh, cell type level uh, expression impact. Uh, and this is work of, I should have actually pointed this out, the previous work was uh, uh, really uh, an amazing graduate student in my group, Krathe Chen, uh, who developed this together with Jan Zhou, who was started this as a postdoc in my group, but has uh, actually uh, been a really successful junior faculty member of UT Southwestern. So the previous same model is really developed in very close collaboration with Jan, who actually pioneered all of the these deep learning approaches in my group and uh, in general. So this work is actually done by Senia Sokolova, uh, another really talented graduate student in the group, and uh, by uh, Chandra Tesfield, who is uh, an incredible experimentalist, basically an experimentalist uh, PI in my group uh, at Princeton. So uh, what does this mean? So we've actually focused on, uh, I believe it's seven different organs, uh, purely because that's where we had uh, high quality and uh, sufficiently uh, large uh, single cell gene expression data sets, so we can train them. Uh, and you can see the organs here. So. Uh, there, are, uh, you can see how many cell types are available for each one of them. So for kidney, we have 25 cell types, 22 for lung, 14 for brain, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and on the right, you can see approximately how well these do on holdouts where we hold out whole chromosomes. Uh, so the models never see those chromosomes and we can then evaluate how well our predictions work. Uh, and it, they're actually quite uh, accurate across, there's of course some variation on the uh, across different uh, mod, uh, uh, across different data sets, my guess is you know we can't say for sure, but my guess is it's actually more associated with how um, good the single cell data is, or at least how uh, so how much single cell data we have and its quality than necessarily any sort of deep biology. But uh, the main point here is that we're actually pretty good at being able to predict genes at how high or low their expression is. Um, and then, of course, now the question is, what can we do with it? And does this actually work beyond just simply predicting expression level? Uh, and one, of course, big challenge is annotating clinical variants of unknown significance, right? So I have a feeling this group is actually very familiar with the ClinVar resource, right? Uh, where uh, variants that have been clinically identified have been annotated. And only about 1% um, of these variants are considered pathogenic. There's a number that might be likely pathogenic, likely benign, et cetera. Um, but uh, about 44% of them are uncertain. So nearly half of these variants are really have, there's no clear answer. Uh, so we actually took uh, those variants and just did a very conservative cutoff that was actually experimentally defined. I'm happy to go into this, but under a very, very conservative uh, cutoff for what we mean by expression level disruption uh, for 268 of those variants, Clever predicts an expression level disruption in at least one cell type. And then actually when we looked at them, it turned out that uh, a number of them of these very high impact variants were centered around P10 tumor suppressor gene. We were actually interested in it, not so much for its role in cancer, uh, but for its involvement in autism, which uh, we have a, quite a bit of interest in. And I'm if I, I have time, I might tell you uh, a little more about that. Uh, so P10 um, regulates AKT mTOR pathway. Uh, and uh, when looking at the top ClinVar variants, we found a number of them. Uh, so here we're just looking at the you know, upstream sequence, upstream from P10. Each one of those blue dots is a ClinVar variant. And the Y axis shows how much of a effect uh, clever our approach predicts in terms of expression level disruption for each of those variants and specifically in the neuronal stem cell model. And you can see that there's a number of variants right here that all have a very strong effect. And actually, if you then look under the hood of the deep learning model, you can actually um, basically read out, you can uh, pass in every possible 
uh, variant of a sequence, and then you can essentially read out and sequence logo, and it turns out that this is a YY1 uh, binding site. So uh, we actually, well, Chandra actually focused on these and tested them experimentally uh, in neuroblastoma uh, cell model with a transcriptional luciferase reporter assay. And it turns out in neuroblastoma cells, which are, of course, a, a pretty good um, surrogate for neuronal stem cells, we do indeed see a significant decrease in expression uh, for this uh, top variant. Uh, this is actually cell type specific. So when we look at HEPG2, you know, liver uh, cell line, there is no significant effect. And actually, we uh, I don't have the slide here, but we have, Chandra actually has tested all four of these variants and uh, the story is the same. And then to, she tested one of the variants for which we predict no effect. I can't remember, it's either this one or that one. One of these variants and uh, indeed show that there is no effect in uh, neuroblastoma cell line either. Um, now, hopefully I've convinced you that uh, these models, right, like we can predict biochemical regulatory effects and all the way to cell type specific expression, and that that's actually useful in interpreting uh, variants and clinical variants, both their mechanisms and their effects at the regulatory and transcriptional level. Uh, but what about phenotypes? And so here I'll just show you uh, one hot off the press result uh, in cancer. So. Uh, in cancer, we actually can look pan cancer, right? So across the, I believe this is the ICGC pan cancer, uh, yeah, ICGC uh, pan cancer somatic non coding mutations. Uh, and where we are focusing here around known cancer genes, so cancer genome census genes, and looking at 100 kilobases upstream or downstream of the start side of uh, CGC genes. And if you just do that and nothing else, uh, and then you just divide the patients into groups that either have a high impact SNP in that area as predicted, um, I believe this is by say, uh, or do not have a high impact SNP, there's a significant and actually pretty substantial difference in survival. So the patients that don't have any uh, high impact non-coding variant uh, have substantially and significantly better survival. And one, if any of you are working in cancer, of course, one obvious uh, caveat here is that could be tumor mutation burden, and it is not explained by tumor mutation burden. So, so the obvious uh, uh, covariates are, do not explain any of this. All right, how am I doing on time? Um, let me really quickly tell you about, uh, you know, how can you use these approaches to actually really uh, complement quantitative genetics, uh, uh, GWAS type approaches in the context of cohorts. Uh, so when applying these models to the whole genome sequencing data, uh, we actually focused on autism. And this is a study uh, that was really run by Jan Zhou that I've mentioned before, who is now a faculty member at UT Southwestern. At the time, he was uh, my postdoc at the Simons Foundation. And then Chris Park, who is actually on the market right now, faculty position, and really an incredible scientist and currently a research scientist in my group, but at the time was actually doing his postdoc with Bob Darnell. Uh, in uh, who, of course, is at Rockefeller and runs uh, a, really a, a leader in thinking about RNA binding proteins. Uh, so Chris and uh, Jen really wanted to look at how we can look at these quad uh, study of 7,000 genomes in the Simon Simplex collection, um, where we're looking at father, mother, uh, a child with autism, a proband, and a sibling, all sequenced with whole genome data. And we're trying to see if there is a non-coding variant effect. Is there really a disease burden that's really coming out of purely regulatory non-coding variants in ASD? And we looked at that both at the transcriptional level, which was really led by Jen, and the post-transcriptional level. So Chris actually developed a separate model called Sequeaver uh, that was similar to uh, the models that I've talked about in deep learning, looking at uh, transcriptional effects, but he really developed it for the post-transcriptional effects and training on the CLIP-seq data to uh, predict the effects of variants on binding of RNA binding protein to the mRNA. Uh, and so the question is, uh, so basically for the first time, they were actually able to demonstrate significant burden on these non-coding regulatory de novo mutations. And that was actually the first time in, any human disease. Um, and the reason that they were able to identify it is because even though there was no significant difference in the number of variants uh, that the probands carried compared to the unaffected siblings, there was a significant difference in the how essentially deleterious those variants were at the non-coding level. And here uh, you can see the same picture at the transcriptional level, 
uh, and at the post-transcriptional level, and even whether you focus on all of the genes, so whole genome level, or if you focus on more relevant, you know, so in this case, genes that are either conserved or ASD relevant, and here conserved or specifically focusing on FMRP targets, that um, a protein whose targets have been very strongly implicated in autism and a number of other um, neuropsychiatric disorders. So you can see that uh, there's a significant difference in impact that si this is all normalized to the sibling impact that sibling, uh, the variants that siblings carry in their regulatory space compared to the uh, children that have autism. Uh, and in fact, you can actually experimentally verify this. This, of course, doesn't verify that they're autism associated, but you can verify this uh, in the context of just their transcriptional effect. So we have experimentally shown that a number of the variants with high predicted impact do indeed drive expression differentially in this uh, luciferase reporter assays. Um, and you can see that some of them cause uh, the single base pair change from the proband to the sibling allele causes a decrease um, in expression, and some of them it's the increase in expression. Uh, and in fact, you can get to all of these predictions in human base. Uh, but furthermore, if we actually look at the post transcriptional level, uh, Bob Darnell's group uh, at Rockefeller then uh, verified uh, one of the variants. So this is looking at the regulatory predictions. Uh, affecting the RNA binding proteins, uh, uh, binding to SMEC1 uh, regulatory. Uh, so SMEC1 is a regulatory subunit of uh, serine 3 and kinase. It's been implicated in a number of diseases. It's highly conserved, but it has not actually been prior to this work associated with autism. Uh, and indeed, uh, Bob Group showed that uh, there is indeed a ASD proband specific reduction of the long isoform of SMEC1. Furthermore, actually, when we look in the context of post-transcriptional variants, we can indeed, again, go all the way to phenotype. So it's very hard, of course, with regulatory variants, it's even harder to go all the way to phenotype because, of course, every variant, every separate variant has a smaller effect size. And it's a combination that really uh, causes the deleterious consequences. Um, and so in this case, actually, we do have enough power to go all the way uh, to phenotype to uh, find a significant association between low proband IQ uh, and its association with higher extent of dysregulation, this post-transcriptional dysregulation in children with autism. And then Chris actually uh, took this further. So he had this idea that it would be really important to see whether this is really a specific to autism and to de novo rare variants. Or could this be a general effect, especially in psychiatric disorders? So he decided to look at common variants. So now we're looking in the context of GWAS. So we're looking at common variants. We're looking at inherited variants as opposed to de novo rare variants. And we're looking beyond autism at, um, at several different uh, neuropsychiatric diseases. And he wanted to ask this question, is there really genome-wide e effect from uh, dysregulation of RNA binding protein target sites, right? So we're talking about, you know, of course, RNA binding proteins have been implicated in a number of psychiatric disorders previously, but we're talking about situations where, for example, FMRP itself is totally functional. There's no variance affecting FMRP, but it's a binding site where FMRP is supposed to bind uh, to its target to uh, do its work uh, that's mutated. And so FMRP isn't binding at the site and therefore potentially causing the disease. So how much is, is this important in neuropsychiatric diseases beyond autism? Is this important in context of common variants? And so that's the question he decided to ask by simply uh, running his, so remember he has this RBP model called Seek Weaver. In fact, he has 232 of these models, each for a specific RNA binding protein. And so for each of those models, he can run it through the, um, Original allele, right? The reference versus the alternative allele. Uh, that means he has a ex predicted RBP binding of the reference versus two alternative, and that the ratio of those two gives you an estimate of RBP dysregulation out of these deep learners. And so, the question to answer the question that he posed, he would need to see whether this estimated extent of RBP dysregulation is proportional to the pathogenic impact that has been found by genome-wide association studies. So this is looking at the GWAS data from uh, Psychiatric Genomics Consortium, uh, looking across five different, so this is you know the five different studies where uh, we have enough uh, power, right? ADHD, ASD, bipolar, major depression, schizophrenia, 
Uh, and what you're looking at is exactly that. So you're looking at the uh, you know, p-value uh, of association, right? This is the cutoff. So all the models that are shown in color, in bright color above the FDR uh, less than 0.05 line are the ones that show significant association between the extent of RBP binding site dysregulation and the estimated pathogenicity from the GWAS study. And you can see that there's a number of models, uh, the number of RBP proteins whose target sites are mutated in these studies um, across all of these diseases. And that's actually, so this effect is very much general. What to me was actually very surprising. And uh, I guess Chris said, oh yeah, I expected it because I guess he was indoctrinated in the importance of RNA binding proteins and post-transcriptional regulation uh, in Bob Darnell's lab. And he was absolutely right, is that not simply is this real significant and uh, across all of these different diseases, as well as whether inherited and rare and common variants. Uh, but actually the size of these effects, if we look at uh, the degree of heterogeneity, they explain actually the impact, the effect size is actually significantly higher than that of uh, common coding variants. So that to me was actually uh, surprising, but uh, very interesting. Oops. And so then to uh, really wrap this up, I just want to point out that, of course, so far I've been talking, you know, I'm talking about groups of variants, but I'm really never linking them together in the context of how they're affecting different aspects of the cell. But in reality, of course, these single variants and single genes are not working separately. It's really important to put them in the context of the networks. And actually, a whole other side of my lab really focuses on understanding of networks. And uh, we build this uh, human-based website where actually from thousands and thousands of data sets, including gene expression, physical interaction data, uh, et cetera. We actually build these cell type and tissue specific networks, as well as networks that, that are reflective of different stages of disease and development. Uh, and we can use these networks in a number of different contexts, including to understand how, for example, groups of variants or groups of genes that come out of uh, quantitative genetic studies are organized and impacting different pathways. Uh, in the context of specific cell types. So this is just a network clustering of uh, uh, Alzheimer's disease, GWAS catalog genes uh, with the, I believe this brain network. And you can see that of course, that's identifying clear clusters um, that are reflective of the pathways that are being affected uh, in Alzheimer's disease. And human-based in fact actually uh, does a number, uh, has a number of resources. It has these networks you can, use them uh, interactively, but you can also download them if you are a bioinformatician and want to analyze them in your lab. You can do this functional module discovery, what I showed you before. It could be a group of genes that came out of a quantitative genetic study. It could be a large cluster that you saw uh, in uh, your RNA-seq analysis. It could be a large genetic screen that you did and you're trying to interpret what are is really the processes that are happening there. Uh, and then, of course, all of the variant predictions that I've talked about, such as the say analysis, um, and uh, actually Clever is in review right now, but it will replace uh, Expector, which is our tissue-specific uh, gene expression variant prediction. So Clever is the first one that can actually do it for uh, cell type level, uh, for primary human cell types, not just cell lines. Uh, but, you know, the if you are actually interested in those results, I can also uh, connect, get you access to them before it's even published. So uh, I very much encourage you to check out HumanBase, humanbase.io, and all of that is available there. And of course, I don't actually um, do anything very useful anymore. I just give talks and talk to smart people and you know work with incredible students, postdocs, and research scientists in the group. Uh, and I think I've, as I've gone, I've acknowledged everyone, but just in case here they are again. So thank you. This was great. Thank you, Olga. Uh, this is a lot of information and, uh, you know, 40 minutes. Um, <laughs> I would like to uh, open the session for questions, please. There will be a quiz at the end, Christoph. <laughs> Maybe else uh, people are thinking about their questions. Uh, I mean, I'm, I'm actually really impressed with, set, with say method and the fact that you can predict loss of function and uh, get gain of function. Uh, of non-coding variants. I think that's a really, uh, you know, unique feature of the method. Um, so, so um, I mean, you integrated over a, a huge number of different chromatin profiles to, to uh, train the model. Could you comment a little bit about which um, 
which profiles were most useful in training the model? Is that something that you looked at? Uh, and you know, what, which features are kind of most predictive of um, uh, you know functional effects? So that's a really good question. I had, I guess, in the context of say, it's very hard to really weigh. Right, like it's more about which ones we have higher accuracy versus worse, and which cell types. And you know, it's as you know, it's some of the answers are obvious. Like obviously, there's so much more data on uh, blood cell types and you know immune etc that you do get but you actually get pretty high accuracy well you saw that for gene expression prediction for example kidney was actually the most accurate one and this was not because we did something special it just even though we do work a lot on kidney in this case it was just purely because it kidney was the most accurate one we weren't doing this in collaboration with matthias or anything it just was really good uh so you know you actually do get quite a bit because you know cell types that have less representation in this model there's multitask learning too so they do get a little bit of a boost if there there's relevant data information from other cell types where you do get the weighting that you're thinking about is whether once you start predicting uh cell type specific expression or tissue specific expression then you essentially can see in those classifiers which of those uh you know profiles were most useful and i have to say i don't actually remember what the answer is for clever I'm sure at some point we discussed this and I don't remember. I do remember when we worked on Expector, which was the tissue specific and non-primary, but you know, in theory similar, um, the least information was from uh, uh, chromatin openness from attack seek, right? Which I guess is understandable. It doesn't mean that attack seek is not useful. In fact, we have other methods that use it a ton. So I think it's very useful data type. It's just, if you have, uh, if you have transcription factor data in abundance for those same tissues, then you get less out of a tech seek. I actually will go back. I promise I'll get you the answer for uh, cell type specificity. My bet is that once you go deep enough down, you you don't have as much data, right, for those specific cellular contexts for transcription factors and you know and hi specific histone marks. Then it might be really useful to have the chromatin accessibility data. Uh, so my bet is that it's that that sort of you know weighting mismatch is less pronounced once you're getting into very specific context. Great. Any other questions? P please uh, feel free to unmute yourself or raise your hand. Okay, as people are waiting, maybe I'll ask another question. I mean, I was really impressed by the large effect sizes on heritability of the RNA binding protein uh, or variants um, predicted to uh, affect RNA binding. Um, could, could you, you kind of went over this quickly, but what's the uh, more or less fraction of the uh, uh, SNP-based heritability that can be attributed to to RNA binding, uh, variants affecting RNA binding, just kind of... That is a really good question. I don't remember the specific numbers. That's a great question. I remember it was, uh, it should be in that, ah, that was not good. I was trying to just go back. Hold on. It should be in that uh, graph. There we go. Uh, we just have effect size. I do not remember the exact fractions. Uh, all I have is effect size in here. So you can see like, you know, but I'll get you this, this uh, it's in the paper as well, but I just don't remember what exactly it is. I just remember the effect size, you know, that this graph was the. Great. And honestly, okay. also, I mean, uh, Christoph, I don't know if this is, I don't know how much this is brain specific or not. In this case, it's clearly general in sense that within the brain it's general. But you could argue either direction, like you could argue that it might be a brain specific sort of signal because, you know, for example, transport, right? Like a so in the brain, right? Like RNA transport is so critical given the shape of the cells. And that may be less critical in other contexts, but I don't know, right? Like if you, I mean, my bet is that Bob, I actually haven't had this conversation with Bob right now. My bet is that Bob will say that it's more general, but I don't know. Uh, we don't, so all I can say is that it is, this effect is general in, um, across rare or common variants and uh, looking at, you know, inherited versus um, de novo and mm -hmm. across these number of diseases, but that's about all I can say. Well, at least in the context of common uh, variants, inherited variants across these diseases, obviously the de novo is just based on autism. I do have one question here on chat. Uh, it is from Yanja. Um, 
and uh, the question is maybe I'll just read it off. Can you please comment on the deep learning architecture design? Is there any special consideration to improve uh, prediction accuracy? Uh, yeah, so the it's a CNN in these cases. I don't think necessarily it has to be a CNN. We've been looking at transformer. I'm trying to wait. Hold on. I have. I thought I had a picture of say somewhere. Give me a second. Oh, there we go. Look at that. All right. So, whoops, that didn't work. Sorry. I think I have to un high and skip it, and then I can show it. Let's see. That worked. All right. Uh, so the architecture really starts with this four thousand base pair right so the input sequence at the bottle bottom and then the residual connections between linear and nonlinear convolutional blocks and then you have these uh uh you know dilated convolutions and then finally into spline basis functions really just to reduce dimensionality in the spatial dimension and then finally you predict those twenty two thousand uh profiles and the main reason really to do this actually it wasn't so much the accuracy so our previous models didn't have these residual connections and dilated convolutions it was more of a standard cnn uh setup um and they didn't have the splines uh and the reason for them wasn't actually so much i mean it is accurate i think it's slightly more accurate than deep sea our initial model i can't remember it, it's definitely a bit more accurate but it's not the goal, so both of them are actually very accurate. The goal was actually to just be able to cover this huge amount of, right? Like the, the scale is just enormously larger because it's going in these 100 base pairs through the whole genome. That's very different than what we did before or anyone has done before. And so really the residual um, connections and dilated convolutions are there for uh, training efficiency and the splines were just to add uh to the memory efficiency because they're so much more efficient than a fully connected layer so it wasn't so much you know so it does actually work more accurately but the goal was actually to keep accuracy at least as high and improve efficiency that's really what's happening there it it seems like a huge amount of computation and in, in general um, do you envision that you will retrain the model as more data is becoming available and um, perhaps retrain it at the higher base pair resolution like as you mentioned perhaps at the single base pair and at what time point that would be possible uh yeah no i mean we we totally so the thing is we don't actually we can predict any of it right like so if you come to me and say i have this sequence right we can run it for you we don't need to retrain it so the training doesn't right like the the reason that you need to do the 100 base pair steps, that's actually already the application of the train model, right? To be able to identify those sequence classes. So for that, honestly, I don't think we really need to go. I mean, we could, but I don't think we absolutely need to. Um, what would be cool is be able to generate sort of a, you know, a lookup table of every single variant at every single point, right? Like so that any, you know, you already can actually log on and run, say, for your sequence, but it takes a while and then it will return for you. How cool would it be if we could just like for any variant, you could get the full matrix of all of the effects? That is uh, a lot of work. Um, we will be retraining, right? Like, I mean, for example, one thing we're doing right now is methylation, right? Like this does not have methylation. I have a feeling, well, now I've given it away, but it's the question that gets asked literally every time I give a seminar, one of the first questions. So we will have, if you're sitting there thinking, where's methylation? We're uh, working on getting methylation. There's some, um, uh, it's not as trivial as just throwing methylation in. So it, it actually requires some thinking, uh, but we will have methylation soon. And yes, as more, and also like just as more, uh, you know, feature, right? Like as more cheap seek data sets come out, not even just the features, right? But the cell types and the primary data, right? Like the, obviously we will be retraining. I see uh, VJ has his hand up. Please speak up. Hi, this is a wonderful talk. Uh, this is a great talk. In fact, I learned a lot. Um, so when, when you look at the, um, so this, for example, aging process, uh, you don't have a sequence variation on a primary sequence of a DNA or even an RNA, uh, but you have a large changes in transcriptomes or proteomes. How, does your model or you do you have any model that can uh, predict based on the cellular landscape uh, that changes uh, in the transcriptome or proteome? So we 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 don't yet, uh, but we're very interested in the questions of this dynamics. We've actually been thinking about it quite a bit, just uh, talking about it. And a lot of it is that we need the data that's really giving us the dynamics, right? Like the transcriptional data that gives us the dynamics where we can start linking the different aspects of it that are 
affecting the changes, right? Um, being able to see how these changes are driven by different genetic, right? Like genetic uh, backgrounds. Um, and so right now, um, I think our current conclusion is that maybe aging is too hard, but maybe we could do something like development, like, you know, early on, you know, cell differentiation or something like that. Just like what dynamic, you know, can we pick a dynamic process for which we have good enough longitudinal data linked to genetic sequencing? And unfortunately, we don't have the data yet, but the we were thinking maybe cellular differentiation is the place to go. If you know of any data sets or, um, you know, where we can use it or some collaborations, that's, it's definitely something that, I think it's the, one of the big next frontiers, right? The other one being, of course, um, the environmental effects and linking that in the context of the genome, right? Like the goal isn't to predict the entire human out of the genetics, right? Like it's more just linking the genetics with the other measurements and being able to have a much better understanding of processes and diseases. Wonderful, thank you so much. Thank you for a great question. Any other questions? I've managed to thoroughly confuse everyone. Oh, this was great. Um, it's a lot to digest, but uh, thank you so much, Olga. This was wonderful. Thanks thank for you. taking your time. It was a great pleasure to be here. And thank you again uh, for inviting me, Christoph, and uh, to everyone for coming. Okay, bye everyone. Great. Bye, everyone.